Hey everyone, welcome to the program, WRSA Radio. I'm your host, G1. As always, I hope you're having a good week. My dental adventure continues. I, I found out that I will need a root canal and a crown, which is no fun at all and not exactly a low-cost procedure. Uh, next week looks to be, well, it looks to be really fun. I, I could be absolutely out of my mind on painkillers for the whole post-election spectacle for a day or so. Uh, probably not that long, but uh, it, it should be just great. Now, hopefully it all goes well and I don't need anything that powerful, nothing more than maybe a over-the-counter Tylenol or something like that. But we shall see. I've, I've seen root canals go really fine. Uh, my wife's had them and, and had didn't even have to take any meds but I've seen people I've seen people have really bad bad goes at it and and be uh be down and out for the count for uh, a day or so so we'll see how it all goes but anyway what do we have on the program today well I have a good many things floating around that I considered for the show but I want to hit on a couple of more or at least one more of the Project 2025 things. So let's start with that. I mentioned in the last couple of episodes that the Harris campaign has been pushing this message uh, that that Trump supports a national retail sales tax. But over the last two weeks, I've noticed that message has been changing. And now as as more people uh, apparently are looking into this message and maybe they're finding out that this is bogus... I don't know what's what's how this is being driven, but the message has been evolved to be that Trump supports what is in effect a national sales tax. Well, boys and girls, that's a little more than a subtle shift. Okay, the fact that it's it's happening at all, you know, in and of itself is telling. It's it's an admission that the message was was falling far short of the impact that they thought that it was going to have. So they, they've had to modify it. Now what they're talking about now, and, and they're, they're, they're getting to, is the tariffs that Trump supports. Now this is nothing new at all. Trump has made it very clear since his first campaign and his first administration that he supports tariffs. He enacted tariffs. You know, he, he increased tariffs on goods imported in the United States. It's a it's a means to encourage companies to repatriate their business. And despite the message that the Harris campaign is putting out there, uh, studies have been done that show that tariffs do not directly impact the cost of goods sold, at, at least, uh, uh, you know, up to a point. There's an equilibrium there. But uh, the, there, there are a lot of pressures put on commerce, and it, it's a balancing act for companies to absorb the cost or pass those costs on in the form of higher prices. The advantages go to the companies that can cut their cost and still keep the product or service at a price that the market is willing to pay. The overall cost of goods, however, has has some room in it for dealing with things like tariffs and unexpected changes. They 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 are willing to 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 move a little bit. I saw this directly uh, at the company that I used to work for back during the first administration, Trump's first administration, uh, we had technology costs that were impacted by tariffs that Trump put into place during his his administration on China, particularly. We 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 made changes. We relocated our manufacturing out of Chinese locations, Chinese companies, uh, moved them to to other Asian. Uh, places, which is exactly what the tariff was intended to do. So this messaging by the Harris campaign is, of course, false. It's, it's speculation at best based off assumptions that have little basis in fact. Even, you know, worst case scenario, yeah, there might be some companies that are impacted by a tariff that have to raise some costs. But it's just you're just wildly speculating. You don't know what companies would would be involved there, how much that would cost, what that would look like, how that would impact their business. You you just don't know. You're speculating. But is there anything in the Project Twenty Twenty Five book about 
a national retail sales tax. There is information in there, positions in there about about tariffs. That's something that, you know, again, Trump supports. Now, I found, I had not found anything mentioned in the Mandate for Leadership document that Project 2025 put out uh, about a retail sales tax until this week. There, there is a single line in a paragraph about suggested tax reforms in their, their uh, section about how to reform the, the IRS and, and tax policy and some of these other uh, things. There's a single line in there. Now, I'll read you the entire paragraph and put a graphic of it in the video so you can see it for yourself. Uh, the section is, is a, a bold highlight, fundamental tax reform is what it's called. Uh, it says, achieving fundamental tax reform offers the prospect of a dramatic improvement in American living standards and an equally dramatic reduction in tax compliance costs. Lobbyists, lawyers, benefit consultants, accountants, and tax preparers would see their inc incomes decline. However, the federal income tax system heavily taxes capital and corporate income and discourages work, savings, and investment. The public finance literature is clear that a consumption tax would minimize government's distortion of private economic decisions and thus be the least ec uh, economically harmful way to raise federal tax revenues. There are several forms that a consumption tax would take, including a national sales tax, a business transfer tax, a hall rabushka tax, flat tax, or a cash flow tax. That's the end of the quote. That's the section where it's talking about fundamental tax reform, ways to do things differently than punish productivity, punish, uh, punish production, punish earning, which is what our tax code does. I think that's a good thing. I've been, a, as I've mentioned before, I'm a, I'm a proponent of a national retail sales tax. National retail sales tax replacing the income tax, making the income tax illegal, unconstitutional, and not allowing it in the future, replacing it wholly with a consumption-based sales tax where you are taxed when you spend, if you save or if you invest, you don't get taxed on it. I, I, I think it's the most fair and, and a productive way of raising revenue for the country. But that's it. That's, that's the mention of a sales tax. So yet again, it's more BS about this document that is being pushed out there. Now, now I've been on about Project 2025 for a few weeks because I wanted to counter the bad information about it that is being put out there. I, I, if, if I felt like it didn't matter, uh, like it was no big deal, I, it was just sort of the, the chaff in the, in the campaigns, I, I wouldn't have mentioned it. I would not have gone into it. Uh, I really paid much attention to it. But I, I've seen far too many normies and commentators, you know, on the right who, well, I say they're on the right. They're ostensibly on the right. But they're falling for the propaganda. They, they've not really read the document themselves. They've not really gotten into it and learned about it. And so they just dismiss it as being, well, that's a, that's a far right agenda. That's a far right group. And, you know, that's not really what we want to do. You know, Trump... Trump's not really behind all that. And, and so in, in an effort to defend Trump and try to distance him from the document, they, they dismiss it all, and they believe the hype. Well, that kind of gives in to the left, does it not? If you are put on the defense and can't be bothered to educate yourself and defend what really are good, sound, conservative ideas, well, what exactly are you conserving? You're allowing the opposition to dictate the tempo of the engagement. And that's failure. That's, that's failure in practice and theory. Now, I see signs around here put up in, at intersections and things and, and in my home area that are anti-Project 2025. They have a, some, someone has put up these signs. I, I suspect uh, it is the, the local Democratic Party. But the signs have no party affiliation printed on them and they advise people to go to a website there's a little QR code on it and it has a you know a, a, a no project 2025 symbol on there and they put out the same bogus disinformation that the Harris campaign is pushing 
so what concerns me is that normie voters will buy into this. And while they may vote to reelect Trump, they're going to scoff at many of the things that he's going to do. They'll buy into the disinformation and say, well, we, we don't want to do some of these things. You know, we, we don't really want to do that because, and they'll push back on these changes and these changes really need to happen. And they'll push back because they think that, well, those, those originate in some far right religious organization. That's not really true. And I say all this because we're moving into a new phase of the campaign. I, I, I saw a quote, I think it was on Gab, but uh, Concerned American posted it on the, uh, the WRSA website. And it said, Trump is no longer running against Kamala Harris. She's been defeated. Uh, he's now running against the fraud or, or, or something to that effect. I, I totally agree with that. Uh, I would phrase it that, that he's now running against the deep state. And don't, don't fall for the disinformation on that either. Don't, the, the, the deep state is absolutely 100% real. It is, a, it is a thing. It is very much alive and kicking. Now, it's walking a tightrope right now. Just, just a few minutes ago, I said that, that prices and goods are you know, a careful balance between cost and what the market can bear. Well, well, the deep state has to carefully balance the reality that happens and the message that they put out there, the market has to bear that message. When the message gets so far out of touch with the reality that people can just, you know, unobjectively see or objectively see. When it gets so far out of touch with that reality, the consumer's not going to buy it. So they're faced with the reality that the story of a Kamala Harris victory is going to be so far out of touch with the reality that the market's not going to believe it. And it will lead to unrest. People will not buy that. They will not accept that. Now, the deep states painted themselves into this position, and now they're trying to navigate out of it and still maintain their control. And they're very good at this. Don't, don't underestimate them one bit. But I think that's exactly what we're going to see over the next four years. There is going to be unrest, which is something that many of us have been saying for a long time. But it looks, I'm 100% certain that this is coming. This, this, this is going to happen. It may happen as early as next week. It may be next year, next quarter, you know, whatever. But it, it's coming. Now, Concerned American did post a very good piece over on the WRSA site that comes from Zero Hedge, which, you know, admittedly is, a, is not the, the greatest source for accuracy, but it's an opinion piece. And, and I think their opinion uh, over there from various posters is, is just as accurate as everybody else's. So uh, I think it's valuable to go and read it because I think it, it, it really... <sighs> Tyler lays out his views on the coming administration and it, and it just jives very well with my own. Uh, so it's not confirmation bias necessarily, but it's it's recognition that, uh, well, I'm not alone in seeing it as this, this is the most likely outcome here. And he basically says that Trump is going to win because it's too big now. Like I said, it's, it's, it's too big to rig. However, the groundwork is already being laid for resistance. Forces are being mobilized, and you can expect to see a full-spectrum conflict waged not just against Trump, but against his supporters as well. And we've already seen this played out uh, over the last four years. But man, that's, that's been a soft run. What we've thought has been pretty bad, the things that we've talked about on this show and we've talked about in various platforms over the last four years, uh, we thought that's, that, that's been pretty bad, that we would never live to see the day that those kind of things would happen in the United States. It's going to get worse. Uh, it, it, what we've seen to this point is just what they could legally get away with, what they could hide and, and obscure and still have a, a, a small ledge of, of legal credibility on. When the gloves are off next week, all that goes out the window. And like I spoke of last week, they're building the conditions for justifying their actions. 
they're going to say that it was stolen or, or whatever. They're, they're, they'll come up with a reason uh, with the election, that, that, that there were criminal actions that took place, that Trump is Hitler, and so you have to do what your conscience tells you, that you must and resist Trump and his fascist forces. They're, they're, they're already prepping the battle space for that. Because, see, the, the deep state is not afraid of conflict at all. Don't mistake what I said a few minutes ago for me being just overly optimistic or high on hopium. I promise you I haven't started taking any meds for my tooth yet. Not at all. Not at all. They, they don't fear conflict. What they fear is conflict that they do not control. Conflict that they're not running. They don't want to be reactive. They, they, they understand that you have to be dictating the tempo and dictating the actions to your target, to your people that you're going after, the organization or whatever it is that you're, you're trying to, to affect. They have to be in charge of the resistance, though, so that they have full control of what and who is targeted. See, they're counting on something. They, they're confident that if they control the forces that are underground and the resistance, if they control those, that the supporters of Trump and the administration will sit on the sidelines and be spectators. Those of us, those of you, who are listening to this show, those of us who have been in this circle for a long time, they, they're counting on us to sit back and allow the administration to do the work and say, yeah, go after them. Take... Take these agencies and these groups that we've been railing against for the last four years and turn them on the enemies of the people. They want us to do that because they can't control us. They want the conflict to be between their street fighters and those government agencies or those government agents because they control them as well. That's how they assure that they are running the full picture. If there are people out there doing their own thing, going off the reservation, so to speak, well, those people are outside of their control, and they are truly terrified of that. They don't know from one day to the next what's on the table and what's going to happen. I've talked before about how conflicts organize themselves. If things will happen between the two groups that are in conflict in an unspoken way, that the, the rules of engagement, so to speak, will naturally evolve. When one side does something, the other side will continue to do things at that same level until it escalates. And things that you may not have thought possible before might happen if one side takes the initiative to do that or, or sinks to that level, so to speak, right? Um, they want to be able to control both sides of the conflict so that things happen, but that things that they don't control and it doesn't escalate outside of their control. Okay, if that makes sense. They could see, for example, oh, I don't know, maybe the power goes out to some major liberal city, leftist city, for example, and, and that city descends into chaos, and that chaos starts to spread. That kind of thing happening, that gets out of control, okay? And then, and then you'll have a reprisal, and it just it starts going back and forth and escalate. They don't want something like that happening. So next week, I predict a Trump win. Uh, which will probably not be official until later. Maybe even by the time I do another episode, uh, we'll we'll know something along the uh, uh, of of what's really going to happen. But maybe not. But it will kick off some spicy times, uh, originating from the left. I think. I think they're going to hit the streets, and they're going to riot and cause problems. Uh, demonstrate, sorry, demonstrate mostly peaceful demonstrations. So what does that mean for you? Well, if you didn't get it done yet, you need to prioritize it now because your time is running out. You're going to have a very, very short window here left to take care of some of those preps and those things that you need to, to get done and taken care of 
uh, before all of this starts to unfold. And we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, we don't know exactly where they will demonstrate or they will cause problems, but I, I think they will. I think we'll see, uh, especially on if it goes the way I think it will, and on Inauguration Day, that we'll see another wave of protests take place in Washington like we did when Trump was first inaugurated into office. Uh, you know, there, there are some things that I unfortunately didn't get done over the last few months, and I may be faced with, with some of these challenges myself in, in completing those tasks here in, in the coming future. So don't feel too bad about it if you still have things hanging out there. Uh, it, it's happened, happens to everybody. It, like I said, it's happened to me. Uh, just, uh, just, just prioritize it. Just get what you can done uh, as soon as you can. At any rate, that is all that I have time for this week. Like and subscribe. Come see us over on Gab, Nice Crew, and the Cold Fury blog. And the good Lord will, and I will see you on the next episode.